Before I go any further, I just want to take a moment to thank our musicians, our choir. They've been here all day blessing us. Thank you. And we've got folks back in the production booth back there and upstairs. Thank you all for the time you put in to make this beautiful service. Well, I want to tell you a story. It's a 3,000 year old story. This story was ancient when Jesus was walking the earth. And it's not a traditional Christmas story, but it, it could be. The story is about a woman named Naomi who finds herself in desperate straits. 10 years before this, Naomi and her husband Elimelech and their two sons were living in the town of Bethlehem, a town that's still around today. Bethlehem means house of bread in Hebrew. But Bethlehem at this particular time had no bread. They were in a time of famine. And so Elimelech leads his wife and children in a difficult decision to leave the land of God's promise in Bethlehem and to go into the land of God's enemies, the land of Moab. They went there seeking light and life, and sadly what they found there was darkness and death. The first blow was Elimelech. He dies, we don't know how, but Naomi is left as a widow. And some of you have been through that experience. You know how earth shattering it is to lose your life partner, how disorienting that whole season can be. But uh, uh, Naomi and her two sons continue on. Those two sons take Moabite wives, which would not have been an ideal situation for an Israelite, but that's what was available in Moab. But it wasn't long before tragedy strikes again and her one son dies and then her second son dies. I haven't lost a child, but I've walked with some of you through the loss of children and I've seen that there is no pain like the pain of losing a child, let alone two children. Naomi buries one son, two sons, all her sons. And so she finds herself living in a foreign land with a foreign God and a foreign language with no one to protect her, no one to provide for her and two Moabite daughter-in-laws to take care of. Situation like this has led more than one good woman into the world's oldest profession and certainly it could have been the case with Naomi. But into the midst of this misery and darkness comes word that God had visited Israel and there was bread in Bethlehem. And so Naomi and her two Moabite daughters-in-law make their way back to Bethlehem. And as they're journeying back, Naomi realizes she has nothing to offer these young women. She has no other sons. She has no prospects. All she has to offer is the poverty that she's about to enter into. And so she tells them to go home to Moab to their families and have new husbands and and have children. And one of the daughter-in-laws returns home. And the other daughter-in-law, whose name is Ruth, demonstrates one of the most astounding displays of love and loyalty that history has ever recorded. And she said these words that you might have heard at a wedding sometime along the way. She said, do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. Wouldn't you like to be loved with a love like that? A love that will never let go. Well, Naomi and Ruth continue their journey to Bethlehem, and when they arrive, the townspeople recognize Naomi, and they say, Could this be Naomi after 10 years? And Naomi said, don't call me Naomi, which in Hebrew means pleasant. She said, call me Mara, which in Hebrew means bitter. She had gone out to Moab full of life, pleasant, with a husband and two sons. 
she returned home empty, barren, and bitter. Doesn't life have a way of doing that with us sometimes? You set out on your way, you've got hopes and dreams and plans for the future and what it's going to look like and how it's all going to shake out. You've written the story in advance and yet somewhere along the way you take a wrong turn, maybe two. Somewhere along the way, calamity strikes things outside of your control that you couldn't, couldn't do anything about. And the next thing you know, you find yourself having gone from pleasant to bitter and just wondering how much longer till it's over. Maybe you found yourself resonating with Fontaine's song in Les Miserables when she says, life has killed the dream I dreamed. Have you been there? Are you there? It's a difficult place to be. And it's not just death that can bring us to that point. It could be the death of a marriage that brings us to that place of we never expected at this point in our life to be divorced. It could be the death of your dreams for a, a career where you, you took a move and it was a little bit of a risk, but there was a lot of upside and it didn't work out the way you thought. And now you're out and it's over and there's no going back. Or it could be the dreams that you had for a child who's now grown up rejected your ways, rejected your faith, is sowing in their wild oats and looks unlikely ever to return. Whatever the case, in the midst of the darkness and the bitterness of the moments, you find yourself saying, where did I go wrong? Or maybe more honestly, why did God let this happen to me? It's a painful question to reckon with. But it is the question that many of us are wrestling with. What Naomi and Ruth couldn't see at the time and what you probably can't see in the midst of your darkness either is that though they were at the end of their tether, God was holding on to the other end. So Naomi and Ruth settled down in Bethlehem and Ruth goes out and she begins to glean in the fields. This was the way that poor people were able to get provision by working their way around the edges and picking up the things that the reapers had left behind. It was a subsistence life, not any future there. But Ruth happens to glean in the field of a man named Boaz. And Boaz is a righteous and worthy, worthy man, which were pretty hard to come by in those days in Israel. And he saw this foreigner in his fields with no man, no one to protect or provide. And he provided protection and provision. And he filled her up with bread and food far beyond what a gleaner should receive. And when Ruth goes home to Naomi this morning with a boatload of grain, her mother-in-law looks at her and says, where have you been? And in whose field did you get all of that? And she said, I've been gleaning in the field of a man named Boaz. And when she said the word Boaz, a thrill of hope must have shot through Naomi because she knew Boaz was a relative of her dead husband, Elimelech, which meant he could be a redeemer for their family. Well, what is a redeemer? In ancient Israel, when God brought the people into the land of Canaan, it wasn't exactly their land. It was his land. And he gave it to them with some very particular stipulations that you can read about through the Old Testament. And one of those stipulations existed in order to help make sure that nobody among the people of God would be in poverty. And the essence of the law was this. Every family had a piece of inheritance in the land. Every family had a plot of ground. If you found yourself in financial straits, there was the option of selling your portion of land in order to make ends meet. But every 50 years in a year called the Jubilee, everyone's land returned to its original owners. And the effect of this was that there would not be a situation where one or a group of families collect lots of land while other families 
are in cycles of generational poverty. And so every 50 years is a total reset. If though you've sold your land and you'd like to have it back, you can ask a redeemer to purchase it back for you before the 50 years are up. And that's what Naomi is looking for Boaz to do. But there's another twist in the story. And the other twist in the story is that if Naomi gets her land back from the Redeemer, she doesn't have any heirs. Her husband is gone, her two sons are gone. And so when she dies, the land will just go right back out of the family again. She needs an heir. Therefore, what she needs is someone not only to redeem the land, but someone to provide an heir through a marriage with Ruth the Moabitess, which is a big ask. Well, Naomi sees the kindness that Boaz demonstrates toward Ruth, and she starts to think that maybe this is the way God is going to resolve this situation. So Ruth goes back to the fields day after day. Weeks pass, and Boaz isn't making any moves. So as a good mother-in-law, Naomi, recognizing desperate times call for desperate measures, hatches a plan. And she tells Ruth, clean yourself up, put on a nice dress, anoint yourself with some good-smelling perfume." And watch where Boaz goes and lays down tonight after work. And then while he's sleeping, sneak up to where he is, pull the blankets off of his feet and lay down there. And then he'll tell you what to do. That's risky business. And if any of you are raising daughters, I do not encourage you to suggest this as a method of securing their marriage relationship. But... Ruth obeys her mother-in-law's instructions and she goes and she sneaks into where he's sleeping. She pulls the blanket back off his feet. She lays down quietly. And around midnight, we're told, he, he wakes up startled and says, who are you? And she says, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant for you are a redeemer. Translated into our modern parlance, what she said is, marry me. And Boaz said, I will. But there's another twist in the story. And the twist in the story is Boaz knows he's a redeemer, but he knows there's another redeemer with a closer relation who has the right of first refusal. And so he goes to the town gate and he finds that first redeemer and he lays out a very clever proposition for him. He says to him, essentially, Hey, you know, Naomi's back in town. Land's gone. She needs somebody to buy it back for her. You're the redeemer with the right of her first refusal. Would you like to be the redeemer and redeem this land for her? Now, the guy probably is scheming, thinking a little bit self-interest. And he recognizes that if he becomes the redeemer of that property, it belongs to Naomi. But he also recognizes Naomi doesn't have an heir. She's not likely to have one because of her age and widowed status. Therefore, once Naomi dies, this becomes part of my inheritance. And so he says to Boaz, sure, I'll take that deal. I'll redeem her. And then Boaz's is stroke of genius. He says, oh, wait, there's more. Well, along with the land, you need to marry Ruth the Moabitess and provide an heir for Elimelech and the dead son so that their name will continue in Israel and this land will stay in their family. And the man begins to have second thoughts and we imagine he must go talk to his manager and come back and say, I'm afraid that's a deal I can't make. It's too costly. It will threaten my own inheritance. And so he gives away his right to redemption to Boaz. And there we read, so Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife and he went into her and the Lord gave her conception and she bore a son. Then the woman said to Naomi, blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a redeemer and may his name be renowned in Israel. 
He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons has given birth to him. We Christians love this 3000 year old story of Ruth because Ruth's love for Naomi better than seven sons. This love that will not let go is a picture of the love with which Jesus loves his bride, the church. And while Ruth could say, may nothing but death ever part me from you, Jesus looks at his people and says, not even death can separate me from you. We Christians love this story because the picture of Boaz as the redeemer gives us a beautiful picture of Jesus Christ who is also called a redeemer. And while Boaz threatened his own financial security by taking on Ruth and this property for another family, Jesus actually impoverished himself, the scripture says. He became poor so that we might become rich. He brought us under his protection and provision and shares all of his inheritance with his people. The scripture says that we were under the curse of sin, and yet he redeemed us from the curse. Sin is sometimes described in the Bible as being like a debt. And what the Bible also tells us is it's a debt we can't pay. We owe it, but we cannot pay it. There's no way we can extricate ourselves from this impossible situation of sin and guilt on our hands. But Jesus comes in and he enters into our place and he becomes our substitute on the cross. And through his death, he pays the debt for our sin that we could never pay, thereby setting us free. That's the kind of love that Jesus has for his people, for all of those who, like Ruth, will cast themselves at the feet of the Redeemer. He will take you under his wings and bring you in to his family. Now, as we read those verses, what you might have noticed is that Boaz is not the one who's being praised as the redeemer. The praise is actually directed to this brand new baby. And we wonder, how can a baby be the redeemer? How can a baby be the one who will restore life, cause life to return to a family that's filled with death and darkness? Well, we get a clue as we read through the rest of the story. Then Naomi took the child and laid him up on her lap and became his nurse. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name saying, a son has been born to Naomi. And they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. That is the kicker in this story. Up to now, this is a traditional Hallmark movie 3,000 years ago. But at this point, the first hearers, when they heard those words, they would have said, you've got to be kidding. This is where David came from. This story is where the greatest king we ever knew, he came from that. Out of the midst of darkness like that, that kind of light came to us as a people. Those of you who know David was the greatest king Israel ever had, born in Bethlehem, this same place. And he was the great, great grandfather of the greatest king the world has ever known, also born in Bethlehem, named Jesus Christ. When Obed was born, he meant all the world to Naomi. And when the grandson David was born, he meant all the world to Israel. And when the greater grandson Jesus Christ was born, he meant all the world to all the world. The question tonight is, what has he meant in your world? What does he mean for you? Now, you may be here tonight, you're not a Christian, you don't follow Jesus, you don't pretend to be, but you're here for one reason or another, and we're really glad about that. What I'd like to do is invite you only 
people who don't identify with following Jesus, to join me in a Bible reading group. And the way you can get into it is text this number that's going to be on the screen. And you just text this number, put your name in there, and I'll reach out to you, and we'll set up a time to get a little group of people together. If there's a bunch of people who respond, we'll get several groups together. And what we're gonna do is we're just gonna read the Bible. I'm not gonna preach at you or whatever. I'm just gonna read the Bible. No questions off the table. Ask whatever you want. Just an opportunity for you to explore who this Jesus is. And let me encourage you. He means all the world to a world full of people. It is worth it for you to at least consider his claims. It'll just be five or six weeks. Make sure you take the number down or take a picture of it. We'll have it up again at the end of the service. You can always turn me down later when I reach out to you. It's fine. But consider, as you go through your story and you walk in the midst of darkness and the bitterness of life and whatever forms it might be taking in your life now or perhaps in the future, it's, it's likely that you, like Ruth and Naomi, can't see when you're at the end of your tether, that God is at the other end. But one of the reasons why this story is told is to tell us precisely that, that when you can't imagine that there's any way this can work out for good somewhere down the road, that you can't imagine God is somehow in the midst of this mess with you, he's there. It doesn't mean you're not in darkness, it doesn't mean you're not waiting. But what it means is you can wait with hope. You can wait with expectation. Your Redeemer has come, and He has promised that He will come again. Let's wait for Him faithfully. He will come. Would you pray with me? We thank you, Lord, that you came for us, that you gave up your life on the cross bearing the sin and guilt of the world, to take it away that we might have hope and a future. We pray tonight for all those who feel themselves very much in the gall of bitterness and the darkness of life, that you will shine your light on them and that you will grant them hope to know that you are at the other end, holding them with a love that will not let them go. In Jesus' name, amen.